Hi everyone, it's Miss Rachel from the William Jeans Library, back with The Wild Robot. We're going to read a few more chapters today. Um, this is by Peter Brown, and as I've mentioned already, I'm reading this with permission from the publisher, Little Brown and Company. We're up to chapter 21 now, the introduction. There was an hour each morning in the dim light of dawn when all the island animals were safe. You see, long ago they had agreed not to hunt or harm one another during that hour. They called it the dawn truce. Most mornings the island residents would gather in the great meadow and spend the hour chatting with friends. Of course, not everyone attended these gatherings. The bears had never made an appearance and the vultures just circled high above. But on this particular morning, an unusually large group of animals had come out to discuss some important news. Settle down, everyone. I have something to say. Swooper the owl hooted to the crowd from the lowest branch of a dead tree. Last night, I saw a mysterious creature right here in the great meadow. It seemed to be covered in grass, so I couldn't get a good look at it, but I think it may have been the monster. Looks of concern swept over the crowd. What was the creature doing? said Dart the weasel. It was speaking, said Swooper. It kept repeating the same words over and over again, but each time it sounded a little different. At first it sounded like a cricket, and then it sounded like a raccoon, and then it sounded like an owl. What was it saying? said Dig Down the Groundhog. I could be mistaken, said Swooper, but I think it was saying, Hello, my name is Roz. The crowd began to chatter. Just where was this creature? said Fink's, Fink the fox. Everyone turned as the owl slowly pointed his wing to a grassy lump in the meadow. It was a rather ordinary looking grassy lump until it began to move. As you probably guessed, that grassy lump was Roz. She had been there the whole time, camouflaged, watching, listening, and with all the animals looking at her, she decided to introduce herself. The crowd stared in disbelief as the grassy lump started shaking and bulging upward and crumbling apart. And there was the robot. Then, using her body and voice, the robot spoke to the animals in their own language. Hello, my name is Roz. The crowd gasped. Swooper fluttered up from his branch and screeched, It's the monster! The crowd gasped. Swooper... Oh, I read that already. Sorry. I got all excited about the monster. I'm not a monster, said Roz. I am a robot. A flock of sparrows suddenly took off. Leave us alone, squeaked Dart as he crouched low in the grass. Return to whatever horrible place you came from. I come from here, said Roz. I have spent my whole life on this island. Why haven't you spoken to us sooner, screeched the owl from higher up in the tree. I did not know the animal language until now, said the robot. Crown Point the buck had heard enough, and he slipped into the forest with his family. So what do you want from us, growled Fink. I have observed that different animals have different ways of surviving, said the robot. I would like each of you to teach me your survival techniques. I'm not going to help you, screeched the owl from the very top of the tree. You seem so unnatural. The monster's just waiting to gobble us up, shrieked Dig Down, and the groundhog disappeared into a hole. I will not gobble anyone up, said Roz. I have no need for food. You don't need food, Fink relaxed a bit. Well, I need food and lots of it. Why don't you make yourself useful and find me some food? What would you like me to do, said Roz. Can you hunt? The fox smiled at a hare on the far side of the gathering. 
It's almost time for breakfast. I cannot hunt, but I could gather berries. The fox's smile disappeared. Berries? I'm hungry for meat, not berries. Good luck to you, Roz. You're going to need it. And the fox trotted away. Roz looked up at the tree, but the owl had gone. And when the robot looked down again, she realized that everyone else had gone too. There she was, all alone. Chapter 22, The New Word. A new word was spreading across the island. The word was Roz. Everyone was talking about the robot and they wanted nothing to do with her. I don't think I'll ever feel comfortable knowing that Roz is on the prowl. I hope Roz camouflages herself as a rock forever. Shh, there's Roz now. Let's get out of here. Roz wandered the island, covered in dirt and green growing things, and everywhere she went, she heard unfriendly words. The words would have made most creatures quite sad, but as you know, robots don't feel emotions, and in these moments, that was probably for the best. Chapter 23, The Wounded Fox. My face! My beautiful face! Somebody help! Fink the fox was lying on a log, howling in pain, with a face full of long, sharp quills. When Roz appeared, isn't there anybody else who can help? Would you like me to leave? said the robot. No, please don't go. I'll take what I can get. What happened? I didn't think that porcupine could see me in the bushes, but when I went for his throat, suddenly there were quills in my face. Why did you go for his throat? Why do you think? Because I was hungry. If you had not attacked the porcupine, you would not have quills in your face. Yes, Roz, I know that, but a fox has got to eat. I just didn't expect him to put up such a fight. Look, there are even quills in my paws. I can't walk. My face is numb. I could die if you don't help me. What would you like me to do, said the robot. I'd like you to pull out the quills. Roz calmly knelt beside Fink and said, I will pull out the quills. The robot started to tug on a quill, but it snapped off in her fingers. Fink yelped and said, pinch it closer to the skin. So Roz pinched the broken quill closer to the skin, and then, very slowly, she pulled it out. The fox winced in pain and said through his teeth, Please, Roz, pull them out faster. This is agony. Roz quickly tugged out another quill, then another and another. The fox lay perfectly still, eyes closed tightly, wind whistling through his nose, until every single quill had been removed and placed in a neat pile beside him. Fink struggled to his feet. Thanks, Roz, I, I owe you one. The fox smiled briefly, and then he limped away. Chapter 24, The Accident. As Roz wandered through springtime, she saw all the different ways that animals entered the world. She saw birds guarding their eggs like treasures until the chicks finally hatched. She saw deer give birth to fawns who were up and running in a matter of minutes. Many newborns were greeted by loving families. Some were on their own from their very first breath. And, as you're about to find out, a few poor goslings would never even get a chance to hatch. Roz was climbing down one of the forest cliffs when the accident happened. The wind started blowing out of the north and suddenly clouds were rushing over the island. With the clouds came a spring shower, a downpour actually, and there was our robot clamping her hands onto a wet block of stone on the side of the cliff. But the block couldn't handle the extra weight. And as the heavy robot hung there, cracks suddenly shot through the stone and it started breaking apart down went the robot, plummeting into the treetops below. She crashed through branch after branch before finally hooking an arm around one. Then she dangled there, 
gently swinging as rocks roared past her on their way to the forest floor. When the dust settled, Roz shimmied down the tree trunk. The ground was littered with broken rocks and splintered wood and pulverized shrubs. And within all that rubble was a goose nest that had been torn to shreds. Two dead geese and four smashed eggs lay among the carnage. The robot stared at them with her softly glowing eyes, and something clicked deep inside her computer brain. Roz realized she had caused the deaths of an entire family of geese. Chapter 25, The Egg. As Roz stood in the rain, staring down at those poor lifeless geese, her sensitive ears detected a faint peeping sound coming from somewhere nearby. She followed the peeps over to a clump of wet leaves on the ground, and when she peeled back the leaves, she discovered a single perfect goose egg sunk in the mud. Mama! Mama! peeped a tiny muffled voice from within the egg. The robot gently cradled the fragile thing in her hand. Without a family, the unhatched gosling inside would surely die. Roz knew that some animals had to die for others to live. That was how the wilderness worked. But would she allow her accident to cause the death of yet another gosling? After a moment, the robot started to walk. Carefully holding the egg, she moved through the forest and away from that sad scene. But she didn't get far before Fink burst out from the bushes. What happened? The fox panted. The whole forest was shaking. There was an accident, said the robot. I was climbing those cliffs when the rocks started to fall. You should be more careful, said Fink as he checked out the robot's new scrapes and dents. I'll need your help if I ever have more porcupine trouble. I will be more careful. What do you have there? said Fink, looking up at Roz's hands. A goose egg. Oh, I love eggs. Can I eat it? No. Please? No. Why do you want it? The fox scowled. I thought you didn't eat food. You may not have this egg, Fink. The fox sighed. He scratched his chin, and then he started sniffing the breeze. His nose had found the scent of the dead geese. You can keep your egg! He said as he trotted toward the cliffs. I smell something better! The robot walked on through the misty forest for a long time until she was standing beneath a sprawling oak tree. Roz placed the egg on a pad of moss. Then she snatched grass and twigs from the ground and delicately wove them together to make a little nest. She placed the egg inside the nest, placed the nest on her flat shoulder, and climbed up into the branches. Chapter 26, The Performer. Up in the sprawling oak, the goose egg was peeping and wobbling around its nest. Mama, mama, said the egg. I am not your mother, said Roz. The egg continued peeping and wobbling until nightfall when the gosling inside settled down to sleep and the eggs became quite still, and the egg became quite still. The robot was about to settle into her own kind of sleep when she heard something in the underbrush below. Roz peered down from the branches and saw weeds rustling in the moonlight. A creature was crawling past, but the creature stayed low, hiding in the darkest shadows so that Roz couldn't see who it was. Roz wasn't the only one watching. A pair of furry ears rose up behind a log. The ears belonged to a very hungry badger. He lay in wait as the shadowy creature came closer and closer, and when the time was right, the badger pounced might expect a creature under attack to run for her life or defend herself or at least to scream. But when the badger pounced, this creature just rolled onto her back, stuck out her tongue, 
and died. Not only was she dead, she was rotten. And the badger's face twisted with disgust. Blech! What a stench! He pawed at the stinky corpse a few times and then gave up. No thanks, he grumbled to himself. I'd rather eat beetles. And the badger hurried off to find a less disgusting meal. Had that mysterious creature been frightened to death? And how could her body possibly rot so quickly? Roz was confused, and the robot became considerably more confused an hour later when the dead creature's ears began to flicker, her nose began to twitch, and she rolled onto her feet and went on her way as if nothing had happened. The robot's voice called down from the tree, are you alive or are you dead? The creature's voice hissed up from the shadows. Who's there? Why have you been watching me? What you just did was unbelievable, said Roz. I could not look away. Unbelievable? Really? The creature's voice seemed to be softening. I thought perhaps I overdid it when I stuck out my tongue. I was certain you were dead. Oh, what a lovely thing to say. Were you dead? Well, of course not. Nobody can actually come back from the dead. It was just an act. I do not understand. It's simple. I knew that if I played dead and really laid it on thick, that old badger would be so disgusted that he'd run off. And that is exactly what happened. We opossums are natural performers, you know. That's the badger. So you are an opossum. Roz's computer brain quickly retrieved any information it had on opossums. You are a marsupial and are nocturnal and are known for mimicking the appearance and smell of dead animals when threatened. It's true. Death scenes are my specialty, said the opossum. But I have a wide dramatic range, believe me. I believe you. Have you done any acting, said the opossum. I have not, said the robot. Well, you should. You might enjoy it. You can start by imagining the character you'd like to be. How do they move and speak? What are their hopes and fears? How do others react to them? Only when you truly understand a character can you become that character. The two odd creatures sat there, one in a tree, the other in the weeds, and talked about acting. The opossum went on and on about her various acting methods and her triumphant performances, and our robot absorbed every word. But why do you pretend to be something you are not, said the robot. Because it's fun, said the opossum, and because it helps me survive, as you just saw. You never know, it might help you survive too. Soon, the robot's computer brain was humming with activity, performing could be a survival strategy. If the opossum could pretend to be dead, the robot could pretend to be alive. She could act less robotic and more natural, and if she could pretend to be friendly, she might make some friends, and they might help her live longer and better. Yes, this was an excellent plan. Roz wasted no time and spoke her next words in the friendliest voice she could muster. Madam Marsupial, it would be a great honor and absolute privilege if you would kindly inform me of your name. Raz's friendly demeanor needed some work, but it was a start. Yes, of course, said the opossum. My name is Pinktail. And you are? Leaves gently shook as Roz climbed down from the tree. It is a very lovely pleasure to make your acquaintance, my dear Pinktail. A moment later, the robot stepped into the moonlight. My name is Roz. Oh my, the opossum gasped. You're the m monster. I am not a monster. I am a robot and I'm harmless. Harmless, really? Well, you do seem rather gentle and I heard someone say that you don't eat any food at all, which makes no sense, but hopefully it means you won't eat me. I will not eat you, said the robot. I'm so glad to hear that, said the opossum. And a moment later, she too stepped into the moonlight. It's nice to meet you, Roz. 
a weak smile appeared on Pinktail's pointy face. Roz thought things were going really well, but she didn't know what to say next. Neither did Pinktail. So the two friendly creatures just stood there together and listened to the crickets for a while. Well, I should be on my way, said Pinktail at last. Have a nice evening, Roz. Have the nicest evening, Pinktail. I shall look forward to the pleasure of encountering you again in the future. Soon, I hope. Farewell. With that awkward goodbye, Pinktail slipped back into the weeds and Roz climbed back into the tree. Chapter 27, The Gosling. Something was happening inside the goose egg. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, crunch. A tiny bill poked through the eggshell, peeped once, and then continued crunching away. The hole grew bigger and bigger, and then, like a robot breaking from a crate, the hatchling pulled himself out into the world. He lay quietly in his nest with his eyes closed, surrounded by chips of broken shell. And when his eyes slowly winked open, the very first thing he saw was the robot looking back. Mama! Mama! peeped the gosling. I am not your mother, said the robot. I am not your mother. Food! Food! The gosling was hungry. Of course he was. So using her friendliest voice, Roz said, What would you like to eat, little darling? Food! was the only response. The hatchling was far too young to be helpful. Roz needed to find a grown goose. So she scooped up the nest with the gosling inside, placed it on her flat shoulder, and marched through the forest searching for geese. And there's a picture of the new baby gosling. We're gonna read one more chapter for now. Chapter 28, The Old Goose. Ordinarily, the forest animals would have run away from the monster but they were awfully curious why she was carrying a hatchling on her shoulder. And once Roz explained the situation, the animals actually tried to help. A frog pointed Roz up to the squirrels. A squirrel recommended that she speak with the magpies, and then a magpie sent them over to the beaver pond. The ground grew soggier, the grass grew taller, and soon the robot and the gosling were looking across a wide, murky pond. Dragonflies buzzed through the reeds. Turtles sunned themselves on a log. Schools of small fish gathered in the shadows. And there, floating in the center of the pond, was an old gray goose. A very good morning to you, the robot's friendly voice boomed over the water. I have an adorable little gosling with me. The goose just stared. I am in need of your assistance, said Roz. Actually, the gosling is in great need of your assistance. The goose didn't move. Food, peeped the gosling. That tiny voice was more than the old goose could bear, and she began gliding across the pond and squawking to the robot, What are you doing with that hungry hatchling? Where are his parents? There was a terrible accident, said Roz. It was my fault. This gosling is the only survivor. If there was a terrible accident, why does your voice sound so cheerful? The goose flapped her wings. Are you sure you didn't eat his parents? I am sure I did not eat his parents, said Roz, returning to her normal voice. I do not eat anything, including parents. The goose squinted at the robot, and then she said, Do you know who his parents were? I do not know. Well, they must have belonged to one of the other flocks on the island, because nobody in my flock is missing. Will you take the gosling? I most certainly will not, squawked the goose. I can't take in every orphan I see. You say this is your fault? It seems that it's up to you to make things right. Mama! Mama! 
peeped the gosling. I have tried to tell him that I am not his mother, said the robot, but he does not understand. Well, you'll have to act like his mother if you want him to survive. There was that word again, act. Very slowly, the robot was learning to act friendly. Maybe she could learn to act motherly as well. You do want him to survive, don't you? said the goose. Yes, I do want him to survive, said the robot, but I do not know how to act like a mother. Ah, oh, it's nothing. You just have to provide the gosling with food and water and shelter, make him feel loved, but don't pamper him too much. Keep him away from danger and make sure he learns to walk and talk and swim and fly and get along with others and look after himself. And that's really all there is to motherhood. <laughs> the robot stared. Mama, food, said the gosling. Now would probably be a good time to feed your son, said the goose. Yes, of course, said the robot. What should I feed him? Give him some mashed up grass, and if a few insects get in there, all the better. Roz tore several blades of grass from the mound, from the ground. She mashed them into a ball and then dropped the ball into the nest. The gosling shook his tail feathers and chewed his very first bites of food. By the name, my name is Loudwing, said the goose. Everyone already knows your name, Roz, but what's the gosling's name? I do not know, the robot looked at her adopted son. What is your name, Gosling? He can't name himself, squawked Loudwing. And then, with a loud burst of wing beats, the goose fluttered up from the pond and landed right on Roz's head. Water streamed down the robot's dusty body as Loud Loudwing leaned over the nest. Oh dear, he certainly is a tiny thing, said Loudwing. He must be a runt. I'll warn you, Roz, runts usually don't last very long. And with you for a mother, it'll take a miracle for him to survive. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. However, the gosling still deserves a name. Let's see here. His bill is an unusually bright color. It's actually quite lovely. If I were his mother, I'd call him Bright Bill. But you're his mother, so it's up to you. His name will be Bright Bill, said Roz, as the goose fluttered back to the water. And we will live by this pond where he can be around other geese. I will find us a sturdy tree nearby. You will do no such thing, the goose flapped her wings. A tree is no place for a gosling. Bright Bill needs to live on the ground like a normal goose. Loudwing sized up the robot. I suppose you two will need a rather large home. You'd better speak with Mr. Beaver. He can build anything. He's a little gruff at times, but if you're extra friendly, I'm sure he'll help you out. And if he gives you trouble, remind him that he owes me a favor. All right, friends, I hope you will join me again, and we will start next time with Chapter 29, The Beavers.